What is up folks? So I've got a video here by this lady Sinu Joseph who was a major voice uh, about maybe three years back talking about why women should not be allowed to go to Shabrimala. But this reel was created a couple of days ago and she in this reel she explains something about some reason, some rationalizations on uh, why uh, women should not be allowed uh, and why that's impacting their health. And I've also got on, uh, along with that, a video over here on YouTube of her talking about uh, the actual science behind why it impacts women's health. So we're going to look at both of them and uh, see what fallacies she's making in her arguments. And she's actually making a ton of fallacies. So we'll look at that. Uh, Shabri Mala is not the only Mala. Mala means hill basically in Malayalam, where uh, women are uh, not told to enter. In fact, in Shabrimala, we have this restriction of women in menstrual age. But if you look at Mount Athos in Greece, you look at Mount Omin in Japan, both these places are at an altitude of over 5,000 feet. Uh, and here, it is even female animals who are not allowed to enter. Okay, uh, so I have an article over here where they talk about exactly this. You can look at this article, it's on this website by National Secular Society. And it talks about Mount Athos, Mount Omin in Japan, all these places. And the reasoning for this is that these are religious places where there are celibate male monks. And to avoid distractions for them, women are not allowed to go there. And Mount Athos is so strict that this restriction is even applied to animals. So let's continue here listening to her and I'll talk more about it. And both these places have monasteries where they have only male monks. And females of all ages are barred from entry. Now if you look into the studies, there is enough research out there which shows that high altitude affects female fertility. And it is with this understanding that these restrictions have come. If you look at Shabrimala, it is at the height of just 1000 odd feet. But that 41 day yatra, the journey that devotees have to make, they have to climb 18 hills. One among these 18 hills is Karimala, which is at a height of 6,660 feet. And even the more, uh, most ardent devotee fears climbing Karimala, a lot of legends around it. So if women went to that altitude of 6,000 odd feet, it will have an impact on their fertility, which could even result in an early menopause. So if you see the 41 day yatra as well as the temple, both have a negative impact on women's gynecological health. Regarding what she's saying, I can assure you, I'm very sure I'm not looking it up now, but I'm very sure the research that talks about how high altitude uh, affects women's health is some faulty research in some really third rate journal or something. And she hasn't provided that research, that exact research. Uh, so if she talked about exactly what that is, I, uh, I, we could have looked it up right here, but I'm very sure I haven't looked it up. Uh, so I'll give her the benefit of doubt. I think that's fair since I'm not looking it up. I'm not going to mark research not provided. Although what I want to do is do a more deep dive video in which I do examine what research is out there. But I'll do that deep dive video on the main channel. Here we're only reacting to what she's saying. Regarding Mount Athos and Mount Omin, uh, these are UNESCO heritage sites that are UNESCO protected with like government, uh, state, uh, funds or whatever and being a place like that having like uh, women being restricted is basically discrimination so the talk of women's rights can be found throughout UN's various agencies including the UNESCO and they talk about this regarding these places also so it's not like these places are uh, immune to any uh, protests they do happen over here as well but even if they didn't her argument commits a fallacy. Her argument that, you know, it happens in these places, so why not in Shabrimala? That kind of argument is basically what about re? What about re? I've looked it up. It's not really there on uh, this grid. So I'm going to mark two cookie. What about re is a subcategory of two cookie. Uh, two cookie is basically saying, hey, who are you to say that? That's hypocrisy. Look at this place where it's being practiced. That is what about re, but I'm going to mark two cookie. I can also see that what she's saying is a rationalization because there are religious reasons why there are restrictions like these, but she's giving a scientific uh, reasoning for this, for which you can rationalize the religious belief. 
So I'm gonna mark that here. Now, this is the Ruti video where she is uh, giving that reasoning. A lot of signs why women's health will be impacted. Let's listen to it. There are six of the major chakras aligned around along your spinal column. And Shabri Mala represents the sixth chakra, which is the higher of the chakras located between your eyebrows, called the Agnya Chakra. And when you straight away walk into Shabri Mala, without going through the other six temples, which correspond to your other six chakras, then... I think we can mark something right away. We can mark uh, one, using signs to justify beliefs and chakras, which are an extraordinary claim without any evidence. So all I would say to her right now is provide evidence for what you're claiming. Are there chakras, are these physical, tangible things, testable things in your spinal cord? There's no evidence, there's no accepted peer-reviewed research on the existence of chakras. So everything you're saying in your reasoning from this point forward sounds like bullshit to me. But uh, let's listen to what more you have to say. You are causing an excessive activity in the Agnya region the region of the Agnya Chakra. Now, the thing about chakras is that they correspond to our body's endocrine glands. Right. So right. the lower chakras of Muladhara, they correspond to our excretory organs and they facilitate those processes. The second chakra from below called the Swadishthana Chakra, it directly corresponds to our reproductive organs. So I will leave out the others in between for a purpose of this explanation. So we have Agnya, which corresponds to your pituitary gland, and then we have the Swadishthana and the Muladhara, which correspond to your reproductive and eliminative processes. See, she's sprinkling a little bit of science in between the pseudoscience. She's talking about the pituitary gland, which is an actual gland in the human body and the reproductive organs, whatever. Yeah, that is clearly a, you know, a use of science to justify herb leaves. If you are only triggering the pituitary gland, by going into places that have to do with the Agnya Chakra. It's a great thing for men because this will cause the release of testosterone by a complex series of processes. How? So you have the hypothalamus. How, how, how? Just explain how. How does this chakra being activated release testosterone in the body? That will release something called GnRH, which will signal the pituitary, that will release LH and FSH, and then LH will cause the creation of testosterone. Okay, Up to wait, this wait, let's hear that again. Because this will cause the release of testosterone by a complex series of processes. So you have the hypothalamus that will release something called GnRH, which will signal the pituitary that will release. So why does the hypothalamus release GnRH? So how does the chakra play a role in that? It's LH and FSH, and then LH will cause the creation of testosterone. Right, this is only how testosterone gets created in the body. That explanation you have given, but why does the chakra play a role in this process? That's what you have not explained. Up to this point, it's the same for men and women. Now, we all know that testosterone is an important androgen, a male hormone. So it's very beneficial for men to go to these places because it helps them bring about a certain balance. If there is any reduction or a, or, or a loss of it, it helps to increase that and balance it. So it helps male body in a beautiful way because when the agnya is triggered, pituitary is activated and that causes release of testosterone. This just occurred to me. Children, small children are allowed to go to Shabrimala. So below the age of 10 or before menstruating, uh, women are also allowed. Do these chakras get activated for those children too? Or, the, or do the children not have the chakra at all? Do their bodies also produce a lot of testosterone? And testosterone inevitably will activate a lot of processes in the body that generate or create male physical features like facial hair, Adam's apple, all these things, muscle mass. Testosterone plays a role in all those features. Why doesn't that happen to children? This happens for women. So in women's bodies, yes, we have testosterone, but that's in a minute, minute proportion compared to what we have in a male body. And it is, in fact, testosterone that your ovaries and adrenal glands will act upon to convert it into estrogen, which is a female hormone. So she's sprinkling a little bit of valid science because testosterone uh, being converted by the body into estrogen is a legit thing. She's sprinkling some legit valid science in between her pseudoscience. What is all this chakra bullshit? So for women, for them to have a good reproductive health, the testosterone that is released in their body by their agnya triggering the pituitary has to necessarily be converted into a female hormone. Now that conversion happens in your ovaries governed by your Swadishthana chakra. 
But if you create an excess energization of just the Agnya, and at the same rate, you don't energize the Swadhisthana, your ovaries are not able to keep up. Wait, so you're saying if you activate your uh, reproductive chakra, then you're allowed to go to Shaprimala? Women are allowed? I don't think that's the position you have. So menstrual cycle is this communication between your pituitary and your ovaries. So the pituitary is very active. I, I have a question. So for men, you don't need activation of that reproductive chakra, is it? They automatically get testosterone. Huh? But your ovary is not able to convert it. It's not able to send a feedback to the pituitary saying, hey, stop, hormones are enough. Then eventually the ovaries become incapable of keeping up with this highly triggered Agnya Chakra and there will be excess testosterone in the bloodstream of women. So that is why the PCOD and the hyperandrogenism, that is excessive masculine features in women can happen when they are exposed to places like this. See, so far this has just been a theory. Yeah, that's been a theory with no evidence and she's about to provide evidence for it. Let's listen. Uh, just a week or so ago, I received an email for, from a woman who had told me that uh, as a young girl, before Menarche, as a young girl, she had visited Ayappa, Swami Ayappa and Shabimala three times at the age of around nine or ten. And later when her period came, it was always very disturbed, very painful, and she developed highly masculine qualities, excessive facial hair, masculine voice, a masculine physical structure. Okay. And this was a very shocking thing to me because so far... You know what this is? This kind of... How is this evidence? This is a story from personal experience called anecdotal evidence. Using this as legit evidence, strong evidence for your theory is not scientifically a good practice. She's providing anecdotal evidence. The tradition says that it's okay, girls of a younger age can go. But she said that she had a very intense experience at Shabri. If this is sufficient evidence for what you're saying, then all women who go as children to the temple should develop, uh, develop male physical features when they attain reproductive age. That doesn't happen. How do you explain that? Isn't that negative evidence for your theory? And since then, her whole physiology had changed. I'm saying this with her permission. She told me that people need to know if this might help others. So there is so much more about this that we don't know because we don't even realize that there is a science to it. So we are not exploring, we're not doing the studies. But since the time I released the book, I have received such emails from so many women who have told me how such places yeah, can affect them. It's it. not just Shabrimala, by the way. Any place which is a moksha dham mm. will affect women's menstrual cycles in very, very unpleasant ways. I think that's about it. Um, but basically, she used some anecdotal evidence and I think she confirmed her bias. You know, her bias that religiously women should not be allowed to go here. She confirmed it using whatever signs she made up using a bit of pseudoscience. And I think, I think there's also a bit of hindsight bias. So she's biased by the fact that, hey, this used to be the case, but hey, we know all this now. With this knowledge, when you look back at this practice, which has been there long back, this makes sense now. Saying that is hindsight bias. Using that as a reasoning why that's true is hindsight bias. When clearly all this is false. And she cherry picked one person's experience to justify her claims. She cherry picked that and not the uh, uh, thousands, millions of others who don't have the same experience. I think that's about it. No bingo this time either. We have four on this row, but no bingo. But I think we were able to spot a lot of fallacies in our arguments. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the next one.